So I am honored today to introduce Ms. Zaraf Leff, um, author of American Ending, and Mr. Milan, author of The All-American. As you can see, based on the title of their books, why they are paired for this panel. I power read both books as they were so good, I could not put them down. And I am not a person that sits at all. In fact, my husband looked at our dog about two weeks ago and said, I didn't think your mother was capable of this. So both, both authors focus on characters who are youth and want to live the great American dream. Both Bianca, Bianca, Bianca well, um, Mr. Milan will cor correct this um, pronunciation when he comes up here, known as Bucky. So I said, how do you pronounce your character? He said, Bucky. I'm like, I got that part. The other one. <laughs> um, so Bucky in the All-American and Yelena in the American ending experienced great hardships. Both of their families immigrated to the United States. Bucky's from Korea. Yelena's from Russia. Dictionary.com defines hardship as a condition that is difficult to endure. Suffering, deprivation, oppression, lack of comfort, something hard to bear, a life of hardship. This sums up the life of both of these youth. That's all I kept thinking of throughout the books was hardship. Both Bucky and Yelena, along with their companion characters, have a challenging journey based on decisions that their parents made to give them a better life. Their lives are in limbo, in flux, and a state of confusion as it comes to their citizenship versus the term alien, a term used in federal and state law to identify a foreign-born person who lives in the United States, has not naturalized, and is still a citizen of a foreign country. Both Bucky and Yelena are extremely hardworking, doing whatever it takes to live their best life possible despite struggles and surprises that continue to come their way. They both had to grow up at an early age and not finish school. As I read both books, all I kept thinking was, he is just a child. She is just a little girl. And I had so much empathy, compassion, and wanted to take both of them into my home and assist them. Both needed key people to step up to the plate and help them. Both authors provide humor, Travel Through Time, Suspense, Energy, Sagas, and Hope. So please give our authors a warm Gaithersburg welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that. How about I'll be in the middle? You know, all the things you worry about before a festival. I worried that my toenail polish would not be strong enough and I worried that I would forget my book, but I did not worry that 270 would shut down. Um, so thank you for, for struggling to get here and getting here. It, uh, we're writing about struggles, so I guess, that, I guess that fits. And it's funny, when you were describing hardship, I just kept thinking, Russian, Russian, suffering, hardship, hard times. So we're really, I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know what, how big 270 is, but apparently it's a really big deal. So I'm. That's <laughs> how you get here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm so happy to be here because I've never done a book festival like Gaithersburg before. So I'm a I'm a debut author. So like, if I don't know, <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so if I seem like I don't know what I'm doing, I I know what I'm doing. <coughs> he does. Wait till you read his book. It's astonishing. Mm -hmm. So Alice Stevens could not be here yet, and so I'm really glad that you could step in. You obviously know the books, um, and one of the things she asked us to do was to, to read. Sure. So Joe, you want to read first? Yeah, um, I'm going to stand up. Okay. Be comfortable. This is your stage. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I always hated those readings where everyone's, everyone's just kind of sitting back and you're like, you're not really sure what's going on. I like to include everybody. So um, just to kind of wake up, it's early. Could everybody say I? I. Yeah. How about am? Am. I am a running back. Every morning, I run tied to a tire. It barks and growls behind me on the trail, all the way through the woods and up and down the ravine. 
But this morning, just as we get to the bottom, the tire catches something and yanks so hard, the rope snaps and launches me into the stream. The water is cold, my shirt is drenched, and it takes me a moment to get up and slap the goosebumps. I gotta stay positive. Cold boosts testosterone, clears lactic acid, jump starts fast twitch muscle production. This is what Coach Shaw says in the mornings before school starts, and we're shivering in the weight room next to a broken heater, wondering how there could be a zero period. My body is cold, but my thumb is warm. Blood, apply pressure. Breathe, sit on a mossy log, thank first aid, don't be afraid of your blood, like the school counselor said, it is what you are. What I am is a high school running back. Tomorrow, I have a chance to get out of Tibby Cut to be a college running back. Tomorrow, I have my chance, and here, and here my uncle couldn't do that. He made this harness and trains me so that I can. And now my ball cradling hand is bleeding, getting infected, and I'm blinking and breathing through my nose, out my mouth, trying to keep calm, trying not to think of tweakers, looking for a place to smoke some ice, finding my blood-drained body. Look at the hand. Don't be a pansy, Bucky. It's hardly bleeding, not even a helmet button's worth. I strip off what's left of the harness and my drenched shirt and wrap my hand. A squirrel barks up in the tree. Rehearse in your dumb heads, Coach Shaw says. You actualize what you visualize. So rehearse like a champion and execute. The key to mental rehearsal is to imagine a perfect world without anything else. I breathe, close my eyes. Forget the moss, the trees, the gray skies. Don't think how my tire must have caught on a knuckle of cedar root or an old brake caliper. Visualize astroturf, hash marks, hurtling big uglies, bombing down sidelines, running to the end zone and dancing at the foot of the starts and stripes. Blood is nothing, but I don't get to the end zone. Refs kill, kill my play with a whistle. I'm all alone on the field, stranded by a bad call in my own mental rehearsal. On the 50-yard line is a ref who's not a ref, but a grinning Asian dude in a gray members-only jacket and bomber sunglasses. My eyes open fast and wide as they can. A grinning Asian dude? I run, hustle, flee, leave the tire down by the stream. So do you have a book on tape yet? <laughs> really? Wasn't that phenomenal? I mean, you have the perfect voice for that, and um, that was incredible. And I related so well to that as um, an athlete myself. All right, Mary Kay. That was great. Thank you, Joe. <coughs> so my book starts in uh, 1909 in Mariana, Pennsylvania, and I'm just going to take it from the very beginning. We've got all day. I'll read, <coughs> you, I'll read you the whole book. I <coughs> I hoped the sisters I'd never met would never join us. And when they did arrive, I wanted to send them back. That's how American I am. As far as I was concerned, my parents had left the two of them behind and come here to give birth to me. What do you want, a medal? My little brother used to ask. He was born here, but I was born first. Where I was born isn't how I was raised. Though I hailed from Mariana, Pennsylvania, I was brought up hearing that wolves talk and old believers rise from the dead that a good woman can make soup from a stone and a good man's snot is black with coal dust. I'm American, so I figured I didn't have to take what comes the way Ma and Pa did. Our kind of Russian Orthodox is called old believers because they don't believe in making changes or choices. But I aim to choose some things for myself. That included a life away from the mines where most of the men who aren't crushed or gassed end up dead from drink. For years, I was at Ma's apron strings, pickling beets and cucumbers alongside her, boiling diapers, rendering lard for soap. Yelena, 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 she'd say. What kind of mother leaves her daughters behind? A riddle, where the answer was, my kind of mother. She didn't leave the family icon behind, or prayer books her father had copied by hand, or spools of brocade to turn any shirt into a shirt fit for church. She even brought over a tin of ashes scooped from their humble down hearth, given that every family has a domovoy who lives in the stove, and better the devil you know. A few plump raisins set out overnight, 
and the domovoi at most would hide our slippers or let the fruit flies in. She warned us that a nibble of pride or envy would make a monster of him, as if I didn't have enough to fret about. Surely the domovoi would scorch what little food we had or burn up the house with me in it on account of my pride at being American and my envy of my older sisters, so treasured by Ma. The Pittsburgh Buffalo Company supplied Pa with a single ticket to come to Mariana in 1898 and selling all they could, floorboards to doorknobs, only raised enough for one more ticket. If Pa came alone, he wouldn't get a house. If Ma came with him, they had to leave the girls behind. So Baba made up a room in their house for her precious granddaughters, and Ma and Pa promised to send for them within a year. But instead of getting their two girls back, they got me, their first American, on January 31st, 1899. Each night, Ma uncoiled her braided bun and dropped hairpins in her lacquered box painted with Emilian and his magic pipe. pike. She shook out her golden plates, never cut, because that is a sin, and carried them like the train of a dress into our room, letting go so she could hoist our stack of covers. She tucked the heavy wool blanket beneath our chinny-chin chins and perched on our bed, careful not to sit on her hair. Rubbing her swelling be belly, she would ask us, Russian ending? or American ending. Thank you. Also fabulous. And do you have a book on tape yet? Not yet. OK. <laughs> Both of you. That would be fantastic. OK. So we're going to get into some questions. How did you come into writing, Joe? Uh, you know, most writers, they like always wrote, but not me. I, I was. Our oh, moderator. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Perfect timing. Would you like to take over? Yeah. <laughs> Get to catch your breath first. She, Continue, Joe. She's doing a great job. <laughs> All we've done is read, and we've been yeah. waiting for you, Alice. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Perfect timing. Okay. Yes. yes. Take, catch Thank your breath. So um, we're on the first question. How did you come into <laughs> writing? Joe's responding <laughs> yeah. first. Thank you for stepping in so ably. Thank you very much. Thanks. Applause. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Um, yeah, so writing, um, I, s I, I always wrote for myself, but I never really showed it to anybody, and I wasn't very good at it, and I knew this because the few writing classes I took in college, my teachers told me I wasn't very good at it. Um, <laughs> and I actually wasn't all that interested in writing because I was really into filmmaking, and so I read lots of screenplays, I read lots of theater plays. And that's what I loved. And one day, after I'd graduated college, I was living in South Korea. And as a, as a gift, m one of my uncles had sent me a subscription to Creative, S Creative Screenwriter. It was a magazine. I don't know if it's still printed. But, um, and I was hoping to like, someday like, get a film, like, write a script and sell it, do the whole Hollywood thing. And what ended up happening was in, there was an article in the magazine that said that writing prose is really easy and it's really easy it's so much easier to sell your novel than it is to s sell your screenplay which is n no that's <laughs> not <laughs> that's not true at all um but the the argument was like if you can write it as a novel and after you wrote it as a screenplay you it will it will make your career like you have two ways to go blah blah blah, blah and it, it develops your writing chops all this kind of stuff and so i sat down one night working on this screenplay that wasn't very good and I decided, okay, I'm going to try to turn this into something like a novel. And I started at, like, I, I had gotten off work at, like, 8 or 9 at night. Um, I was teaching night classes at that time. And I started writing, and I just didn't stop. Like, it was a Friday night. I didn't go and hang out with my friends or anything like that. I just started writing, and I kept on writing. And, like, it was lunchtime when I finally kind of stopped for the day. And... It was the first time I had ever done anything that I loved just so much, and I had hoped that it could become good. And so that's really where my, how I came to writing was I decided, like, I love this so much that I want to just devote myself to this. And that started in my mid-20s. So I was a late starter compared to most. So I've always been writing. There's the other side of it. This is my fourth novel. And um, a sort of different question for me is, I really, really believed in making everything up and in, in absurdity and invention. It's fiction. Like, it should just be completely um, invented. And you should sort of be able to levitate the reader. 
So this is a historical novel based on my family's experience, and that was the big shift for me, to write something that was actually based on um, the people in my life. So this feels like a first novel in some ways because mm -hmm. it's so different. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, one, I'll tell you a quick little fun story, which is I'm from Oklahoma City and I'm going to go read in Oklahoma City in July. And the mayor's father was my English teacher. And so I've invited him and the mayor and the mayor's father are coming to the reading. And, and yesterday the high school called me. When does that happen? This many years after high school. And she was saying, you know, oh, and he fostered your love of writing. And, and I was like, uh, well, actually, no, no, that's, that's <laughs> not true. And I was thinking about how, that, how I always knew that I was a writer and that was not fostered. And so, you know, you, you just have to know that you're going to keep going. You're going to yeah. write and not stop until... Um, what did someone say that your need for expression is greater than your ability to withstand criticism or something? You know, you just keep going. Um, so I studied all sorts of things, including writing, and people said what they said, and I thought, yeah, well, I'm going to be a writer, so you can say whatever you want. <laughs> I love those answers. Um, yeah, sorry for my late entry. I, uh, yeah, I didn't check the, the traffic. But, um, I, and I'm sorry to miss your readings. Oh, it was spectacular. Hers was, I actually. Know. They were I amazing. Know. He was amazing. You had to choose your own adventure at the end of it, too, like a Russian ending or an uh, American ending. I mean. Oh, so sorry. Um, so I just wanted to uh, start at, with the titles. Um, they both have American in the titles, and... Um, so I wanted to ask why you had American in the title, if, if you, in, you indeed chose the title, and um, what it means that, uh, what American means to you. Yeah, so the, the part that I read, you heard the mother say Russian ending or American ending for her tender American children. But the actual genesis of that was finishing my last novel. I, had a, I have a friend who's Russian, and she just could not understand why it takes so long to write a book. Like, oh, you're still writing that book? You're still, still on the same book? She's like, Tolstoy took six years. What's going on here? So <laughs> I, when I finished the third book, I ran into her, and I thought she'd be so proud of me. And I said, I finished, I finished my book. I got to the ending. And she said, Russian ending or American ending? <laughs> so she started it in my head. And I said to her, well, actually, kind of both. You know, I mean, as, as literary novelists, we don't want everything tied up. We don't want, want everything you know, at the end. So when I was thinking about that, and then it just dripped and dripped in. And now, I mean, we're all riffing on it in my family. My mother called me the other day to say she saw the Garbo version of Anna Karenina, which ends with her holding a child's hand and walking off. And it says on the screen, this is an American ending. The Russian ending is different. My mother's like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Um. My manuscript originally had a different title. It was originally called uh, Without a Handle, which is actually a play on a term that keeps on recycled in, in the book. Um, it, it's a literal translation of oyopta, which is to try to mill rice without a handle, which is imp it's a, it's an impossibility. Um, but when I started working on it with my editor, she was saying, like, you know, like, we could we could probably call it the All-American. And I was like, oh, that that's actually, a good title. It, it makes a lot more sense because, you know, like in college, you're always dreaming of becoming an All-American football player and all that. And so I think I felt like it matched it far better because um, it's emphasizing something different because for me, the, the genesis of the character came from this idea of what would happen if you try to create the most American character possible. Um, I used to teach a class in South Korea called American Culture where it was, uh, there would be like 80 to 100, 100 Korean students in my class who want to know like what are Americans really like? Um, why do they do what they do? <laughs> and, um, and so like one of the, uh, there's no textbook for this kind of class so I had to find a, I found a, um, a thing written by Robert, Robert Coles who used to be, who used to work for the State Department and it was this, uh, it was this chapter of one of his books that used to hand out the dignitaries that was called The 13 Values Americans Live By. And the, they're all these ideals, and of course, contentious ideals, a lot of them, which we all hold, but is the thing that if, if you believe in these things, then that kind of ties you together with all the other Americans. Um, and so I wondered, like, what if, what if 
I made a character that tried to uphold each of these ideas the best he could. And so the idea of being the all-American, that, yeah, I felt like the title really matched. I love that. I mean, what do we share, right? And then also, um, just for the writers in the room, which probably 90% of you are, I had 45 different titles, you know, that I was working through. And um, my publisher said, we're going to put this together with a committee. We're going to get back to you with a title, which you don't want to hear that. You know, oh, a committee is going to choose your title. And I thought, oh, here we go. And then they sent me a note and said, we want to call it American Ending. And I was like, you win. You totally win. I love that. And it so, and it so describes the book. It's a refrain that goes through the entire book as Yelena is thinking it all the time. Like, but this is, is this an American ending? Was this a Russian ending? But we're in America, and this is what's happening to me and to them. Um, so it really resonates. And then I have one more thing to say, which is that when you have a book that comes out, you want it to be singular. You know, this book is like nothing that anyone has ever seen. And, and this season, there are many wonderful books with American in the title. Yeah. Joe's and Laura Scalzo's in the audience. Her book is called American Arcadia. It's fabulous. You should also buy that. Yeah. And there's another, there's another like half dozen books because we're all thinking about these things. I mean, it's incredibly important. And instead of thinking, oh, oh, I felt like, yes, bring it on. Let's all talk about this. So I feel very differently. I feel like I love my title, and I'm glad there's American in every other book. Yeah, that's interesting that, um, that neither one of you uh, actually came up with the title. That wasn't <laughs> your title, the working title. Um, could, do, did you have a working title? Just curious. Oh, mine was uh, Without a Handle. Oh, that's right, yeah. Without a Handle. I had a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for a long time, it was called Buried Sunshine, which is what they called coal. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was Yelena, always Yelena. Anyway, I had a lot of them. Yeah. Um, and it's also interesting that you both tell the immigrant stories. Um, I want to first ask Joe. Um, I'm, a, I'm a transracial adoptee, and this story uh, kind of flirts with the idea that the main character was a transracial adoptee. At first, I was a little, um, I was a little hesitant about uh, doing this panel because I believe very strongly that uh, transracial adoptees should write about transracial adoption because at this point, it's it's um, a narrative that we have to own. Uh, I don't know, if, is it a spoiler alert or <laughs> that? Um, so I just want to ask you, why did you <laughs> present your uh, present your all American? character as somebody who might have been a transracial adoptee? Well, I, when, because I was focusing on the character being, being like this fictitious American, um, I wanted him separated from, from the, the immigrant, because most immigrant nar narratives that I grew up with was always like this dichotomy of like, okay, my, my parents' culture is this, this is a culture at home, and um, I am constantly struggling with that. But I wanted to make, rather than do that kind of immigrant story, my story is about a deportation, because Bucky ends up getting deported um, due to a, um, a, a, a small problem of a check bouncing on his immigration paperwork. And that was enough for him to get deported. Um, I didn't conscious, like, for me, when I was writing it, I, I wanted to make sure that he was he was a, he was abandoned to his stepmother. So, his parents are married, and it was because of their mistake that he was deported. And um, so, like for that, I didn't I didn't think I didn't think too much that it was I was going to that he was. It ne there was never a time where I thought he was going to be adopted. The way I wanted to treat it is kind of like. If you grow up in like a rural rural communities, especially those who are impoverished, you find like what makes up a family unit is always going to be not is never the stereotype. It's never just like the mother and the father. Like there's always like you have you have extended family living there. You have somebody like who's you know a neighbor down the road whose parents are in jail or gone, and there's nothing formal, but they're there. They're just living there, and they're more or less like like siblings. And so kind of with that background, like the way I thought about it is this household has not only uh, Bucky, but he also has a, a stepbrother who is also not related to their stepmother. Um, but they're all this family of step, step 
step people unrelated but they're ma trying to make this home work or you know their single wide trailer work um, and so that's that's I think that's why I set it up like that because I wanted first to kind of talk about that sort of experience that I've seen in in rural spaces in America but also I really wanted to focus on the idea that Bucky is not he what happens when he when someone we always tell ourselves here in America that you can be whatever you want to be. That we have so much choice over like who our, what our identity is. But I wanted to express what happens when no matter what you think, there's all these outside forces which are gonna, they're gonna have a great influence on what you think you are. And so that's, that's, that was my setup. Thanks. Um, yeah, so th that interesting uh, fractured family, making your own family. There's also a uh, fractured family in American ending in um, the fact that there are two older daughters that were left in Russia. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about the role of family in your sure. story? Sure, and I mean, everything you say also resonates because, so again, this is based on all of my grandparents and are from if you go back far enough, Suwalki, which is now Poland. And they're all old believers. My first cousin is the, is the priest of the church in Erie. There's only about six of these churches in America. And, um, and so I wanted to bring the whole, both generations together and maybe backdate it a little bit and talk about some of the things they went through and who gets to be an American citizen is incredibly resonant in both books. Um, but it's so interesting because in my own family and in this too, you know, they want to say, we're American, until somebody else says, are you American? No, we're Russian. And then don't you dare call them Polish. But it's Poland now. So that's hilarious yeah. to me. And, and also that the friction of all of the um, ethnic groups. So in the mines, they just kept importing people, right? They paid their ticket to come and th throw them underground, as it were. And the way that the geographical setup is, it's so damn metaphorical. The mine is at the bottom of the hill, and you've got Welsh and English, first earliest people here, right, and Scottish, and then every stripe is a different ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So then it's Irish, Italian, Slavic, Polish, Russian. So the Russians are at the top of the hill. They're the most hated. They're the farthest from the mine. They're the most recent to come here, but they also get some fresh air. And so when you talk, my great aunt used to say, oh, and we would pick mushrooms, and we would go through the meadows, and we would be in the forest, you know, and then you know, her husband lost two fingers because, I mean, they were in the mines, which was unbelievable. My grandfather had black lung, slept in an oxygen tank for five years. So, you know, it was unbelievably dangerous work. So that's not really what you asked. But the notion of sort of um, what's a family and who are you? What is your identity here? So as soon as the next generation is born here, they don't speak Russian. And the church is not even in Russian, it's in Slavonic, which is a different language entirely. So then how do you keep up these traditions and how important are the traditions and what are you? Are you, you know, my mother and father, I, was gr I grew up in Oklahoma. And my mother used to say, I had to, it's Christian, Greek, Russian, Old Orthodox. She said, I had to decide if I was Christian before I was Orthodox or Orthodox before I was Christian because of course, it's a sin to go into another church. It's a sin to do just about everything. So, you know, she's in Oklahoma, there's no available churches. So then how do you raise kids in Oklahoma and have any of this heritage? So this just keeps going. These questions just keep going. You know, why did you marry dad? Well, there were three choices in the church. It's like, that's not the most romantic answer I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, I love, the, I love the way you um, really convey the sort of claustrophobia about, of the um, environment, of the community. Um, so I also wanted to ask both of you, um, obvious, it seems to me that these are very personal stories that you both wrote. Uh, how did you sort of navigate that? You're, pro you're writing about your family, you're writing about your identity and Korea. How did you navigate those sort of sometimes fraught uh, issues that can come up? I have a short answer to that. So I had history, which unfortunately is set, and then I had the church, and then I had family. And I didn't want to, I wanted to tell a, a story, 
and I wanted to tell the truth, but I also kept worrying that the church that I know is, is it's a much gentler church now that my cousin is the priest and has been for 30 years. It was, it was incredibly just rules, rules, rules. It wasn't about love. It was not about acceptance. Strangers were not welcomed. Um, so I said to Sarah Boxer, who's a writer who lives in Washington, we were talking about this, how I'm trying to navigate these three circles, not worrying about offending, but worrying about um, telling my own truth. And she said, well, it seems like the struggle is actually the, the, you know, the work. And I was like, oh, that's true. The whole struggle is the actual novel. And so that's the kind of balance I'm always, I'm always working on here. For us as Americans, like the weird thing about our literature is that the books that we often point to as like the greatest American novels are almost always a coming of age novel or a, a maturation narrative. If you look at a lot of other traditions, that is not the case. And um, I was talking to, I don't remember, maybe it was a French guy like years ago when I was traveling and he was saying like, I don't know what's up with you Americans. Why are you so obsessed with trying to figure out who you are? Like every one of our novels is about that, and I mean that's that's I think that's something that's very shared among among all of us. Like what makes us us? It's not necessarily where you're born. It's not like the languages you speak. It's really just these collection of beliefs. And so, like for me personally, um, I'm I'm mixed race, and I grew up in a place where there were no other Koreans, Korean Americans who could speak Korean, um, and then you know. I was always having to explain because you would get these questions um, of like where are you from, where are you really from, all that, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff, which is you know it was normal like for me growing up in the 80s and 90s, and um, but when I moved to Korea, the first question would always be like, when are you going back? Like, where are you from? Where are you really from? It was, it was the same. The sort same of thing. thing there. Wow. It's the same thing because like for them, they're like, you're, you're not really Korean. They have a special word. It, like Korean Americans are called gyopos, which is just a like it's like a foreign Korean, which is like you're you're Korean, but you're not really Korean because you know what you're American, um, and it's wonderful that you can speak some Korean, but really like y you don't know how things operate here. And so like all of us who have that experience of being told like, well, you're really from this other place, and then when you go to that other place, they say like, well, you're definitely not one of us. Um, and then you, you're forced into that question of like, how much do I get to choose who I am versus what the rest of the world says I am? And the and corollary to that though is the American story of people then sha putting, throwing shade on people from other places, yeah. which is hilarious, Yeah, it's right? It's like, well, where are you from? You know, oh, I've been in Phil Pennsylvania my whole life and for three generations and right before that and right before that and right before that, like when did you close the door, right? Yeah. We were talking before uh, getting ready for this panel. Like, um, like my my mother always used to tell me that like um, all the real Koreans came to America in I the seventies. I love that. I love that line. Um, <laughs> that there are no real Koreans in Korea, and it's just weird. Like, in, in, I don't know. I have this theory. This is my speculation. I could be completely wrong, but every group of immigrants, when there's a big wave, like you're you're almost like satellites. Like your culture is of that moment of when when you left your country. So like a lot of the Koreans came here in the 70s and 80s, it's almost like like they're of that s cultural like time capsule. Like a lot of the Korean the Korean American mores that like I I knew growing up, like you, I went to Korea and they're like, "What are you talking about, man? Are you like from the like the dictatorship days?" like thinking like that. Um well, and I've got a time capsule and a time capsule because the old believers stopped the clock in 1666. Nothing is allowed after that, okay? And, uh, and they, they're fine with electricity and they're fine with drinking. But there's a lot of other things that are not allowed. And so, you know, there's a costume and, and you're on one side of the church and the other and they're, and they're lighting every single icon. And then when they finish lighting the last one, then they start snuffing out every single icon and the incense is, you know, clouding up. So there's this throwback that, that is preserved in amber. So I go to Russia 10 years ago with my mom and, um, and my cousin and they're talking about their, their sort of resurgence of the letting the old believers be the old believers. And then my sweet cousin would say, well, like, I don't want to you know, correct you, but blah, blah, blah. And before you know it, all the Russians are sitting at his knee and saying, tell us about ourselves. And my grandmother baptized me in a copper bowl in the kitchen. And you know, it, it's a, it was really in flux. Yeah. 
Thank you. I um, yeah, I want to leave time for questions. I I I could keep on asking them all sorts of. I didn't cover the immigrant novel thing, but um, I do want to leave time for audience questions. Uh, so we have ten minutes. If anybody has a question, please ask it now. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, it's fiction. I just want to <laughs> say, like, I, I, I have not been deported. Um, I have not been conscripted. Um, I have never been pulled off a plane. Um, the, the, the thing is that, like, I, we all experience these, these forces both, um, and we just, we, we sometimes just label it luck. I mean, we often do just label it luck. Like, for example, um, how many times are you speeding down this, this highway and then the person behind you is the one that gets caught? Um, but if you're driving a red car, you're always the one caught. <laughs> Nobody told me that when I just bought a red car. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I guess for me, like, because the, the focus of the, of the book was, okay, what are, how much control do we have and how much control do we not? And like ultimately, like for me, I I felt like for for the narrator Bucky, um, the the thing that I I loved hanging out with him about is that this guy believes he believes that he can make his life um, the way he wants it to be, and that is something that is so remarkably like us as Americans. Yes. Like we have that belief. Like to we do incredibly foolish. Obs obscenely like long shot ideas and sometimes they work out I think partly because of luck but also that belief that I can shape the world um, in the image that I want it to be a lot of cultures look at don't look at it that way at all they feel that, like for example in East Asia like one of the things that you're you're it's isn't if it's not explicitly taught it's inferred that you are of you play a role and your duty is to fulfill this role to the best you can because a symphony cannot have only soloists. A symphony cannot only have conductors. If that symphony is going to be gorgeous, it needs all levels. Um, and That's the same theme as Brave New World. Yeah. I'm glad I'm a Delta. I'm glad I wear gray. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, and I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I wanted to I wanted to explore that because I think that's something that, like, in America, like when we're growing up, we don't we don't ever explain that to to people coming up that there are so m I I am we are so fortunate to have our books picked up. There are so many amazing writers that I've met who are working at McDonald's or whatever, who are scribbling away, and they've never had <coughs> some of the chances that I have. I'm not particularly. I'm not particularly privileged, but I've been privileged enough that I know that this sent this. I, I appreciate that I had luck. And but also, I want to go back to what you said about choice. So, I teach a lot of people. I coach a lot of people to write novels, and I teach classes in writing the novel. And I often say to them, pick one verb to describe your entire novel. And um, and and the and the verb for this book is choice, mm. and because she, Elena wants a choice. And uh, everything about her world is to take away that choice, you know, her, when she was born and the religion and the history and the family and, and the poverty. And so um, it's, it's really exciting when a review picks up on that, like this is a little girl trying to get, have some choice, because we're very lucky to have some choices. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think those are very American themes. Um, choice and, and finding your own identity and the privilege, the privilege that Americans have um, in their mindset versus the what other people think. Yeah. Sure. And um, both of you, uh, both of your books deal with the privilege of being American when it's taken away, and uh, with Elena compared to her other um, siblings. Yes. So my question was, will you write another book? And if so, if you were giving the perfect segue, what advice do you have since you've written four? I am working on my second book right now. Yay. So. <laughs> Caveat, like any writer that you meet, like we all have like a, a folder of abandoned children of other <laughs> novels that have never made it. Like I have other completed novels that just will never see the light of day. So like just because I'm writing another book doesn't mean that it'll it'll necessarily, you know, make it to have a nice pretty cover like that or like <laughs> this. But yes, advice, help me. Advice, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. <laughs> I mean, endurance is so much of, of this business. Um, so there's talent and there's connections and there's and then there's endurance because it takes a long time, you know, and it takes a lot of it takes a village to get a book out. Are you working on something? Sure, sure, I'm working on something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to know? <laughs> okay, I think we have like two minutes. Does anybody have a short question they'd like to ask? Well, it's funny because some of, you know, who Yelena happens to be, you know, she is the one who says, but what if, but how come? And not everybody is born that way, right? And what's over that hill? And how do we get the hell out of here, you know? And um, what if I don't want to marry somebody who's a minor? And, and, you know, we're shocked, shocked that you're asking these questions because it's not an environment that fosters questions about the outside. It's a closed, it's a closed system, right? So some of that is just she's, she's born with a lot of pluck and she has the mother who she has and she has, um, and the fact that the second she, I mean, she is American and so the teacher at one point says, well, let's teach everybody about Russia. Maybe that will help some of this conflict in the class. And she's like, why? I, uh, let's learn about America. I'm American. She's insulted that the teacher wants to do that as opposed to thinking, you know, we're gonna teach everyone about everyone else's community. So. She just keeps insisting on it, and some of that is just she's just born that way. So some people have that about them. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to see more. Some don't. Um, I think travel. <laughs> and reading. And reading. I, reading is the cheapest travel there is. Um, and I mean, it's it's actually remarkable. Like the thing, the cool thing about reading when it gets it gets your it's telepathy. Like, it's the closest thing to telepathy that we have. Like, when you're reading a book, you're actually having this te telepathic moment with, with these words and with the author of this image that you think, like, this is, this was going through her head, you know? Like, even, like, her, with her telling, th telling that story about, like, being in the classroom and this, and Yelena, like, fighting for, for what, you know, I want to talk about being American. Like, this is just, like, a brief moment. But when you're reading a book, you're really experiencing that. So I, yes, read more, buy more books, <laughs> um, buy yeah. her book, and please do. And and also, you know, just to talk about, um, we don't talk about this enough. This is such an amazing festival, and I am so grateful to be here. And this community is so wonderful. And so you were talking earlier, you know, buy these books, buy these books as gifts. But also, if you are able, think about buying these books for a classroom of children to that we could then zoom in or talk about because 
we uh, this book for me has been so different from my other books my other books people people say like what an imagination you have oh my goodness what language and this book people are like i have to tell you my story i have to tell you what happened to my people and i would love to talk to more junior high and high school students about this book so that's just a plug for if you have the means feel free yeah. to furnish classrooms with our books and we would talk to them i'm volunteering joe yes. to talk to them. bucky's 17. yeah he's 17 he's the, the kids love it yeah <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>